Hey, GitCon. My name is Jonathan Silva, and welcome to a discussion with Jason Gates of the Sandia National Laboratories. Hey, Jason. How you doing? Welcome to GitCon. Hey, Jonathan. Glad to be here. Jason, do you mind giving us an introduction and telling us a little bit about Sandia? Uh, sure. Um, so let's see, a brief introduction to myself is once upon a time, I was an engineering physicist um, simulating things like magnetically confined high temperature plasmas. Uh, that's actually how I got connected to Sandia, but that's a longer story. Um, while I was doing that work, I realized I was more interested in the applied math running behind the scenes. And as I was working in applied math, I realized all the problems are actually in the software. Um, so I switched over to software engineering. Um, and then after doing that for a time at Northrop Grumman and then uh, coming down to Sandia, I uh, started seeing, well, actually, it's, it's not that the problems are in how we write the algorithms necessarily, but more in kind of how we how we collaborate as you know individuals into a team to write the software together and kind of the policies and practices that either make us really efficient and productive or perhaps get in the way of that. So uh, I don't know what title you would apply to me now, um, but <laughs> you say I, I care about software engineering best practices and helping people to use those to make their lives more joyful as they do their work. So that's me in a nutshell. Sandia National Labs, um, let's see a brief history if you're familiar with the Manhattan Project. Um, so Los Alamos Labs, which is you know, an hour and a half, two hours north of us here in New Mexico, they were the ones in charge of the physics. And then Sandia was set up as the engineering laboratory to take the physics and make it deployable. Um, so these days we do a whole lot more than just blow stuff up though. Uh, we do all sorts of high performance computing and um, all sorts of simulation, material science, kind of everything under the sun, but all in support of our national security missions. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's us at Sandia. I think the public has um, some awareness now because of the blockbuster film Oppenheimer that's right. from the summer. Yeah. So We're I cool wonder, again. yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, wait, I think I know what that is. It's just like, you know, right. more than you did before. Uh, so then it sounds like you've been with the organization for quite some time to the point where you remember the organization before they started using Git and started making the transition um, from not Git to uh, Git version control. Can you tell us a little bit about what that journey was like for any of the teams that you belong to where y'all made that transition. Sure. Yeah. Um, actually, I wound up coming to Sandia shortly after most of the teams I've worked with had made that transition. Okay. Um, but uh, I wound up working with a number of people who were instrumental in helping the teams to make that transition. So uh, in the early days, so this is maybe 15 years ago or so, like late 2000s, early 2010s, the transition was kind of painful. Um, folks were coming from CVS or SVN, and they were used to their particular way of doing things and didn't really want the disruption of changing version control systems, particularly to one, you know, it, if you're just learning Git today, it's really nice compared to learning Git 15, 20 years ago. Um, so there's a lot that's improved in the tooling. Um, I think some of the some of the hurdles were, you know, as, as a lab full of engineering scientist types, um, we've got a lot of people who are scientific subject matter experts that are really good at what they do. Um, but asking them to kind of take a step away from that mentally in order to learn, you know, kind of the ins and outs of the Git version control system was, was a bit of a heavy ask. Um, so... The, there was definitely a tendency for teams to say, like, I, I just want, like, the bare minimum. Like, give me what I need so I can get back to using SVN, but with this new Git tool. Um, and if you know anything about the differences between SVN and Git, you realize that's, that's probably not a good idea. Um, so what, what came out of that uh, eventually is a team was stood up, and eventually I wound up taking leadership of this team to train people in how to use Git. Um, at, at the beginning, it was just, you know, directed toward individual projects like, hey, your project is adopting Git. We'll tailor a, a training to your team and help you through it. Um, 
But after a couple of years of that, we realized, actually, this is something we need to offer to the entire labs because everyone's going through these, this transition. Everyone's having the pain. So we had an introduction to version control in Git course um, that we offered for a few years to everyone, whoever wanted to come take it uh, with us. And then after doing that for a while, we realized, actually, we also need an intermediate Git course because the intro one was kind of bare bones, getting started. This will get you back up and productive. But after you've been doing that for, say, six months or a year or so, it's really time to start learning you know, more advanced workflows that are better for collaboration. How do you incorporate things like code review um, and and uh, various like continuous integration and things like that. So how do you improve your processes now that you know enough about this Git thing to really, you know, make use of it? Um, and uh, I guess over the course of, oh gosh, how many years was it? Maybe maybe seven or eight years or so that, that all of these training efforts were going on. We probably trained about a thousand Sandians. Wow. Um, and then as things sometimes go, priorities shifted, funding dried up, and we were told, sorry, we can't do that anymore. Um, but then you guys introduced the Foundations of Git course at GitCon last year, and I said, great, point everyone to that instead. So huzzah for Git Kraken and the Foundations of Git course. Yeah. That, that's some good stuff. There's so many nuggets in there. I think I'm going to try to like get to... Um, some of the key things that you just said in that um, lovely answer. So I want to get into um, learning Git. One of the fair, it's a, as I've talked to customers and users over the years, one of the fair things that I've just realized is that, you know, you're programming in whatever language or whatever thing you want to do, that is the thing that matters to you. And version control is just meant to help with those efforts, especially if you need to ever go back and troubleshoot or you put it on the shelf and come back to it later and someone else has to figure out what you did or how things got introduced. But mm -hmm. um, when it comes to learning Git, how do you, how did you determine like that this was like, who needed to learn beginner stuff? Who needed to learn intermediate? How What, what advice would you give to organizations who are who have people who don't know much about version control mm -hmm. hygiene um, yeah. and where would you recommend they start? Yeah, that, that's a good question. And I may ramble a bit in the answer, but that's feel free. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so like on the getting started side of things, it's just, um, so, so think about it like this. If, if you're thinking about, um, uh, what would be the right word? You can edit out my, my mind blanking later. But um, <clears throat> if you think about scientists, um, like you picture your standard like image of a scientist, you know, yeah. white lab coat, I'm in a, I'm in a lab with test tubes and beakers and all that, and I'm doing my science, right? Um, and kind of the way you think of it is, you know, brilliant scientist goes off in their lab and does their thing for months and months on end, and then comes back and says, Eureka, I've, I figured it out. Um, when you translate that to the software space, kind of the way um, folks tend to think about it is I, I just want to go work in my office, you know, my lab, my little hidey hole, and I want to do my researchy thing for months and months on end. And when I've got something working, I, I want to come back and say, Eureka, I've done it and give it back to the rest of the team. But when the work that you're doing is software, you've got to understand that there are other people on the team modifying that software in that, you know, nine months or so you've been in your, in your office. Um, so I think that's kind of the first conceptual realization that needs to switch. Like, oh, wait, that we need a different way of doing things because we're using software as basically a communication medium between and among all the scientists and the other people who are, you know, interested as users or, or managers or whatever. Um, so in, in the getting started, it's helping people realize, like, you, you need to be okay with doing your work out in the open, for one. Like, when I... And that... That's hard. So this is a little aside, but you know, you go to school for 12 years or so, and then you go to college for another four. And then if you go to grad school for another four or six or however long it takes, in all of that training, you're told, look, you're supposed to do your work on your own. Don't work with anyone else. That's cheating. And then submit your answer and it's either right or wrong. And then you get out into the working world, particularly in the software space, 
And it's, wait, no, we, we all need to be working together. We need to be sharing what we're doing so that as a team, we can help each other, you know, do better and make sure we're going in the right direction or getting the right answer. And that, that's a very big paradigm shift. Um, so so that, that's one of the big things. Like, you, you got to be okay sharing your work. Mm -hmm. And when you're okay with that conceptually, then it's, you know, kind of introducing folks to the concept of, commit early and often. I mean, that, that's one of the great things about version control is I can keep track of things. Um, and the way we try to tell people is it's, it's not just commit, it's commit and push early and often so that you're backing stuff up and so that folks can see it. Yeah. Like create a work in progress merge request or, or pull request and have your teammates, you know, chime in on that. So then I wanted to touch on one thing you said earlier you were pointing out how understandably so, especially if you go through grad school and you go through the whole experience and then land a job at a lab, you are very much used to working independently. You do collaborate with others, maybe for papers, um, sure. but you still have this mentality of, you know, you're doing your, your work mostly on your own. Mm -hmm. So um, I suppose one of the challenges I've observed is even in the, I'll say pull request, but I know GitLab calls it merge requests. Mm -hmm. um, that that always seemed like a very formal, like a very formal thing. That, that's an, a very, mm -hmm. like, I've created this merge request. I am now ready to have another person look at my work. And that's where all the collaboration or the chit chat happens between, you right. know, the person who's writing the code and the person who's reviewing the code, potentially more people than that. Um, how do you, or do you encounter the challenge of like, to me, it makes more sense for that to happen earlier. Like yeah, the people right. should be talking to each other way before this formal thing, which could be intimidating and scary for some folks because, you know, you're, you put all the work together and then you might potentially have a lot of it like yeah, scratched out and read and like, True. no, redo this, redo this. How do you yeah. like take some of that collaboration or what advice would you have for mm -hmm. teams who are looking to like move that from this very formal object that is the merge request or pull request and maybe earlier in yeah. the workflow? Yeah, no, that, that's a great question. And honestly, I think that's probably one of the biggest barriers I see to collaboration in the software space these days. Um, so like folks, folks try to address it by, you know, instituting a policy, like you only get your work into the main development branch with a pull request. But then sometimes what you see happen is like, I'll, I'll be scrolling through my email notifications. It's like so-and-so created a pull request. And I think, oh, great. So-and-so approved pull requests for themselves. So-and-so merged pull requests. I'm like, wait, no. Wait. Ah. <laughs> so, so to answer your question, um, I think it boils down to, um, to kind of two two things in kind of laying down the culture for the team. And one of those is realizing that all work should start as an issue. Um, and there are exceptions to this. Understand what I'm saying are guidelines, um, but you can, you can break the guidelines if you need to. Um, but start everything as an issue, and that's a place for discussion. It's, it's not necessarily like when I file the issue, I know exactly what I'm going to do. And then I go do it. It's rather when I file the issue, I know something needs to get done, but I'm not exactly sure what that's going to look like. Um, so file the issue. And then, you know, if you want at matching your team members or however your team wants to do it, if you bring it up in a stand up or something, talk through it and take notes and say, okay, th this is what we're thinking. And then just have people chime in on the conversation. So you kind of, you take the, the nebulously defined issue description and kind of whittle it down to it's something that's actually implementable. And at that point, you can assign it to somebody and say, you know, okay, you're, you're the one who's going to be tackling this. How much do you think this is going to take? And then they can, you know, lean back on experience and say, okay, well, that's probably going to take this much and this, uh, okay, so here's my time estimate. Um, and you don't need to be this formal about it, but I'm just giving you an idea of kind of what all you can do in the issue breakdown stage. Um, and then you start work. Um, now, I'll freely admit, sometimes in order to figure out what you're doing, you got to actually start doing it first before anything makes sense. That That's okay. All of this is kind of, you know, wishy-washy. But the the point is to try to, to be intentional about your level of professionalism in it. Um, but then when you get to the point of doing the work, again, you know, small commits early and often, 
feel free to clean up your history as you go, as you get to the point. But what we really encourage folks to do, like, is as soon as you start the work, as soon as you create the branch, create the pull request. I mean, put it in draft mode so no one merges it accidentally, but create the pull request. And then as I'm working on it, it's like, ah, shucks, I don't know what to do here. Okay, let me go, you know, at mention, hey, Ben, you know, I'm thinking this, but that feels kind of iffy. Do you, do you have any better suggestions? And then you, I guess the benefit the pull request gives you is you can have discussions on the code itself. Like you can, you can tag the lines in the diff and say, this is what I'm thinking. Um, and then you, you just got to get everyone okay with the fact that this pull request will evolve, you know, over the course of time that we're working on it till we get to a point where we think it's pretty good. Um, and then we go ahead and merge it. Uh, but then the other thing you got to keep in mind is like, if you merge it and then go, oh, no, we, we screwed up, whatever it is, that's okay. Yeah. You file another issue, you create the branch, you create the pull request and you do it all over again. Like nothing, nothing is set in stone. The repository history is always changing. Um, hopefully just additive changes, but, but yeah, like it's going to be, it's going to be messy like the process you've got to be okay with that amount of messiness i would still recommend like before you merge things clean up the history so that the history tells a coherent story um but as we're doing the work it's it's not a coherent story it's all just kind of flying by the seat of our pants trying to make sense of things um and i guess like the the big hurdle is we've got to be okay with doing that out in the open especially if it's an open source project oh no now the world can see me it's like well deal with it this is this is the same way for everyone nobody is a perfect programmer here all right well jason thanks so much for that lovely discussion thanks so much for being a part of gitcon 2023 yeah thanks for having me it's great to be here